Thanks, Josh, and, and also thanks to Michael who did the previous presentation. Um, as Josh has said, my name's Kent, um, Kent Shelley, but I was also known as Kent Parker, so for those of you who knew me before 2015 when I changed my surname. I thought you said to written the tests. So who here has written tests for Drupal using PHP unit? Well, that's good, yep. Um, but who has intended to but never got round to it? That's good too, and of course, maybe why you're here. Now, mostly the pressure to write tests is for individual modules, which test the functionality of the module itself in isolation. That's what most of the Drupal tests do, but today we're going to look at writing tests for a site build involving multiple modules, contributed, and custom. We've got a, a site specification with complex access permission rules, and to the client, these rules are important and should, should not be violated because privacy is involved and or, of course, money. Just doing a quick overview of the site, it consists of nodes with access to view and edit. The site consists of web forms, also with access rules. We're using view all, update all, view only my, update only my, and administer subscriptions, so that's quite a few of those. And users can apply to other users for permissions to, to access. So we have requests for access, we have pending requests, approved requests, denied requests. And in the site we have a number of custom modules, contrib modules, site configs, and we want to do user logins and therefore this is browser testing. Um, this is a movie theatre, and so I thought we'd have a few movies. And the first one is a demonstration of a user requesting access to have edit control of this node. So they click on request access. Um, we confirm it, of course. And then we can see that the request is pending. Now we go over as the data contributor. Oops, sorry, we go to the data set owner. We view the node, we go to the request tab. And there's the request. So in this case, we're going to accept it. We could decline it, but for this, we're going to accept it. Disappears from the screen. Return to data contributor mode. And we can see that the request is pending. Oh, so you can see the request is pending. We return to the other user and now we can edit that node. Mission accomplished. And in similar vein, we can apply to request access to permissions to a web form. We choose our web form. We select one of the five, any number of the five options. We save it. And now we go to the, the request is pending. Now we go to the data set owner. Go to the request tab. The request is there. And we accept it. We can see the operations. And we go back to the, the other user who applied. And you can view submissions. We now own this particular web form. It's in our tab. So again, a mission accomplished. So, here is your brief. But first, as you can imagine, this process, for man the process of manual testing all that access functionality would be rather tedious. If, as in the case of the site build, having access corresponds with paying money, then you can see how quickly it becomes important for these access rules to work correctly. 
As is pretty much standard with any client, they will ask for alterations to this code at any time, requiring you to repeatedly test the same complex set of rules. So this is where automated that testing becomes not only cost effective, but also life saving, or should I say client saving. Because a screw up in the access rules deployed to production could be costly. And in the case of this site build, it was pretty much test driven development. So that every step of the way, I created a test to ensure that my functionality worked, but also because we had no tester. So in order to create these tests, the following are required. To some extent, this is a revision of what Michael spoke about, but first we create our PHP unit config. We write a test-based class with some traits and test classes. We add the required config and include the required modules. Then we write browser tests and we run the tests using Chrome Driver. Also, we need to create configuration schema and we can view browser output as we debug the tests. And to ensure that your functionality is tested during development, we can set up our browser tests in our CI CD. And finally, we need to maintain our tests. Drupal.org has got very good documentation on setting up PHP unit browser tests. For our PHP unit, we write two versions, two different locations, or one for the local install, one for the test build, and we might as well get ignore the local one. These are the key settings for your PHP unit XML, your base URL, your database connection, and the browser output. So let's write the basis for these tests. We usually use functional or functional JavaScript tests, and we start by creating a test base class that will provide setup for any of the tests done on the site. And in this, we create our test users, in this case, the data contributor and the data owner, and we set the theme for the tests. Then we create any traits for commonly used functions, such as creating nodes or web forms. Uh, we clearly organize and articulate each test we need to create in order to properly test our functionality. And then we prepare to write a test class function for each of those. So to help us prepare and organize, this is kind of an overview of the things that we need to test for the site, like testing access to the dashboard, which were those views that you saw in the demonstration. We need to test that allowed users can view the node, can edit the node, can view an unpublished node. And in this case, the requirements was to be able to view the latest revision, even if unpublished. And then we need to test the opposites, which is that people without published permissions cannot edit the nodes, cannot view unpublished nodes, cannot view latest revisions, and so on and so forth. We need to look at each of the requirements and start a test for each. So I'm just going to do a quick overview of our in full cinematic detail. Just scrolling through, this is our base class. Oh, sorry, yep, and we've, now we've got a test class that extends that base class. And we've got some traits over here. So this is our main DT data sets. We've got four custom functions, custom module, I should say, in this that we're using. One for the data sets or the nodes, one for the web forms, one for the application process, and another one for web form config. And some traits there that um, creates a node request, create a web form request. Doing tests on web form access. And on the config, and a final trade. So the main test functions we're using here are simply Drupal login, 
uh, Drupal, uh, navigating to a page which uses Drupal Get. And we test our access using the status assert session status code equals 403, 404, or 200. And we can also test by the presence or absence of specific text strings on the page. Note that the assert session functions work by outputting a Boolean false or true. If the output is true, then the test passes. If false, it fails. So we need to write our tests so that they always pass, so that output is always true. And we log out again. Obviously, if you have got your custom functions, you also have your custom functions that reside in your base class or trait. Just quickly looking at a, a test function here. This is one of the test functions we've used. A test for a successful request to access a web form. First, the data contributor user logs in and creates a web form. After logging this user out, we log in as the data owner user and check we have access to the dashboard and that there is a text on the page saying request. We could, have, could of course do any a number of different tests to satisfy ourselves that we're in the right place. Next we run a function to make a request to the web form we've just created and we log out. This function defaults to giving us administrator access to the web form. Then we log in as data contributor, navigate to the request page for that web form, check that we're in the right place and, and click on accept request. Since we know we have the only one request for the web form, we can be sure this is the right move to make. And we can always check on this by looking at the browser output. Then we log out again and in again as the data owner and check that we've now got administrator access. While we're creating these tests, we need to ensure we've got the required config and include required modules. Whatever modules and config we include in the test is what is available to us when the test runs. So if we don't specifically include something, it will error out. The automated tests begin with a basic install of Drupal only and everything else we have to add. So when you go to a web page in a test, any config needed for that page must be included in the config install directory of, the mo of a module that gets loaded with it. We need to exclude any config supplied by the basic Drupal install, such as anonymous and authenticated roles, Otherwise, again, if you include those, it errors out. So the config we supply would include the following. Quickly back to our cinematic uh, representations. So this just looking, scrolling through we, the config for our data sets. Um, the data this, this, uh, the module loads that web form access module. And you can see the modules that the config that DZ datasets includes with it in the config install directory. And if we have a look at the info file, these are all the modules that we're loading. And it was a learning process in terms of which modules to load. We come on to that. And in similar vein, just done that one. Required config for web forms. So we can see with web form access, we are loading DZ web form access module, which actually loads DZ data sets. And we have some functional tests there. Just quickly scrolling, and they load DZ apply access. DZ apply access gets loaded. So if you look at the config install directory, this is the config that we include. And if we look at the info file, these are the modules that we're including. Right, um, writing tests, oh, we come to the money part, and run using Chrome driver. So Chrome Driver is pretty easy to use, really. You just install it and you run it using that. Um, there's an excellent write-up at that location. We run our tests with this. You've just seen this in Michael's presentation. We've got a command line. It's just calling PHP unit. Um, dash C is custom uh, PHP unit XML. 
and then we point to the to the well in this case the the parent custom module, knowing that any tests nested within that also get run. So as you build your tests, there'll be many times that there's a missing config, which will require you to add another config. Many configs depend on other configs, and you have to ensure those configs are present for your test to run successfully. If you persist with this process, then your test will eventually run once you have all the configs you need and they appear in the appropriate order. Often you have to ensure that a config appears at the right time in the sequence of module loading so that the fields required in a view, for instance, are loaded either at the same time or before the view is loaded. So we're going to have a quick look at of running a test with missing config. Um, we're reverse engineering this, so we're taking them out of the config install directory and just casting them aside into a temporary directory. Then we run our tests. Oh no, it's the red letter of death. So we're erroring out here. And they've failed. And you can see that, you scroll up, they've all failed, all the tests have failed for the same reason. We're missing no field date published and field date modified. Those two fields that we just removed. Now we look at running a test with a missing module. So in this case, we're reverse engineering, we're going to remove webform, DT webform config from our our config install directory, run the tests. Obviously this is sped up, the tests take much longer than this to run. And we've got our big red letter of death. And uh, we need to run it to the end in order to see our error messages. And again we can see that all our tests have errored out for the same reason and we're missing configuration object which includes DZ webform config but also others because they're probably within that. The next thing is the configuration schema. Uh, in Drupal, they use this qualify inspired schema metadata language for configuration YAML files. So while building and running these tests, just like with the config and the modules, you'll constantly be told of missing schema. But creating configuration schema is not as straightforward as adding the missile config or modules. Uh, I'll show you an example of, here's a, configuration schema here, you can see it's a custom one, it's dtapplyaccess.type with a wildcard and we have six fields in it. Are people, how many people here are familiar with these configuration schema? Okay, that's good. So now we're going to reverse engineer on this on a schema. Uh, we're missing, we've taken out that particular schema and we can see we're not we're not passing e for enough enough no schema for dz apply access type simple data set so we have to understand how on earth we what we do in response to that error message and we need to create a configuration schema now we're going to run, now we look at the test with incomplete schema. In this case, we've got the first part of that schema that we showed before. We run the tests. Same outcome. Despite the fact we're trying something different. And we've got a whole bunch of output here now. With all the missing schema, type missing schema, DZ player type simple description, help, simple data set, and sorry, and display submitted and preview mode. So we can identify each of the missing fields, and then learning about configuration schema, we can 
assemble our configuration file like that. Okay, now running the test locally. We'll look at this in full cinema, cinema, cinema graphic detail. Oh, nice. We've got this friendly little dot now instead of those red letters of death. It's looking positive. When we run the test for this particular site, the whole thing takes about 20 minutes and includes 21 tests with 426 assertions. So obviously, while you're running a test, you're not going to be sitting and staring at screen like this, and this is sped up about 2,000%. You'll be doing something else and then coming back to it later. So, happy days. And we can see here the location of all our browser output. And again, we can view some browser output. Mine's, our theme's not as nicely themed as Michael's was, but it's got a previous next thing that we can flick through and we can see, in this case, we've made an application to access a web form and we're moving between the different users, we're logging in, we're checking access, logging out, and so on and so forth. Debugging the tests. Uh, when running a test, there's no log output unless you create one. So here are a couple of options. One uses the develop module. And in both cases, you include the code in your test base class, and you can put the debug output in your test script. Moving on to using CI CD. Now, to really make these tests worthwhile, it should be run whenever we deploy. This means that if we inadvertently make a change, that breaks any of the functionality, then it will be picked up. In this real world case, we're using Circle CI, but obviously scripts will vary depending on what system you are using and, as we found, versions as well. Essentially, we need to set up a web server here at Ubuntu and a MySQL MariaDB database and configure the server to work. Uh, we also found I had to fiddle with user group memberships in order to, to, what, to make it work. And as a bonus, we run some PHP sniffer tests, and we need to set up permissions on our output directories to avoid fatal errors. And then finally, enable Selenium as our browser simulator. And then, well, we can run them on build. After much testing, failures and debugging, we got the test to work reliably on our development build. The tests in this case, we haven't even got to yet, run for 17 minutes. The whole thing, oh, was about half an hour. Note that this is a good idea. To, note it is a good idea to run this each time code is pushed to the develop branch before merging, rather than any time after that. This ensures that we don't bother to spend any time on code that fails our fundamental tests. Further, there's no need to run these tests at any later stage because once they've passed, well, they've passed. So here we can see we're under the unit tests. I think this is sped up at least 1,500%. And it's kind of, the output is similar to on your local. And there we go, we, we can now merge. Ah. Okay. Finally, maintaining your tests. Obviously, if you make changes to the site, sometimes you have to change the assertions that you make to test with. Um, and yes, when, when you run your tests, you'll find out all about, it, about that. But as far as, the other one is keeping your config changes up to date. You, that's not something that you'll be alerted to. You could be testing stale config. So in order to overcome that, I, I wrote a simple module that provides this function, dz test get module config, 
which implements a hook and updates all our relevant config. And then you, in each of your custom modules, you implement this hook by identifying each of the config items that are in the config install directory. So when you run the function, those files are copied from your site config directory into the config install directory of that module. And there you have it. You have a site that tests itself. Any questions? Well, I was, I mean, I, what I was testing is fairly limited kind of access rules, but a lot of that's just copy and paste. Obviously, I could take a, a, a page out of Michael's book and, and write lots of traits. Obviously, that could be refined a lot. Um, well, obviously, there are different methods you can use, it, but I'm just using the, the Drupal textbook PHP unit testing here. I've used Behat in the past, but I wanted to um, see what Drupal could do with, with them. And I actually think that Drupal uses Behat, does it not? I haven't looked investigated. But um, as you saw in Michael's presentation, if you were here, um, BHAT's included in the mink, isn't it? Yeah, or something like that. So I, I, I don't... Right. Anyway, the, the purpose of, um, of the presentation was perhaps to inspire people to, to, to use testing uh, in their site builds. Um, in this particular case, we didn't have a tester, and so it was worthwhile me spending the time to create the tests so that the production manager, the owner, and I knew or were confident that um, the site did what we wanted it to do. Uh, on, so you, you had something, I can't remember the, the, quite the numbers, but you had somewhere in the vicinity of how many tests and several 21 tests, and I think it was... 400 assertions. 400 assertions, and that took how long to run? Several hours. 17 minutes. 17 minutes, okay, no, not several hours. I think it was 70 minutes on the server and 20 minutes on my local. Ah, okay. Um, but, um, I'd have to admit that um, when I tried running it on a 16 gigabyte memory laptop, it, it wouldn't take it, so 32 gigabytes was the, the so, um, minimum. My question was, um, and I think you answered a little bit about you sort of being more uh, opinionated about when you chose to run them and not running them on every build, for example. But there's sort of a, um, when tests start taking a period of time, it can get to a point where it starts to slow down your change control uh, frequencies. Yeah. Uh, because you have to wait for the tests to run, you know, do your sword fights to wait for things to, um, before you can deploy your changes and get those things out and that can start to impact business. I remember a particular site, I won't name the customer, um, but they had a test suite so large that it did take them something like six hours for it to, to pass. Right, yeah. And it was all built around BHAT and BUD and, and all that sort of thing. Um, and so they, they really invested in the idea that, that um, unit testing was a really important part or you know, um, functional testing was a really important part and that they shouldn't release without all those tests passing. Then they realized that like they couldn't change, you know, couldn't um, you know, get move as fast as they could because of how long it took. So that made them more opinionated about when they chose to run the tests and how you know more governance and policy around change control and what they decided to deliver on and you know kind of led led to other slowdowns in the business essentially as a result of it. Not to mention the long term impact of trying to get change through the barrier of six hours of testing. So you know you would have to. Um, if you broke a test, you know, God forbid, because you would not know how you broke it or with a piece of code that did that and was it the test or was it the code that was supposed to be breaking and all those sorts of things. So do you have a sense of like how much testing is too much testing um, and you know, does performance a factor of that or is it some other, uh, some other aspect? Yeah, sure. So in the case of this um, in our CircleTI, 
the tests were only run when the branch submitted had DZ as a suffix, so prefix. So if if you wanted to, if you were pushing through something that had nothing whatsoever to do with functionality of the site, then you could skip that test. So I mean, you could obviously um, have one bunch of tests for you could divide a site into a functionality and target as long as your developers were um, kept to were well disciplined to ensure that you only run tests on functionality changes that apply to that functionality change. That would be a way to get around. But of course if, if somebody uses the wrong prefix and makes a change to a functionality that isn't tested then but you know but that's one way of minimizing that. We also see the example where you are heading that to a pipeline. And the thing missing here is uh, when you run in a pipeline, like GitLab or something like that, um, you don't have a, a working website. Of course, you can uh, probably run Composer to keep your, uh, your site in your server you created in the pipeline. But for example, the database, uh, where you, which database you are using to test the specific test script during the pipeline inside the pipeline? I don't know if it makes sense. Uh, well, the data, a lot of the contents of the database are created through all the config and the modules that you're you're adding, and then of course the the web forms and nodes that you add as part of your test. So that was the point about. You, go, you start from nothing, you've got to build the whole lot. You've got to add all the config. So your database is being filled with all that config, those modules, and you're adding nodes. And obviously over 21 tests, you end up adding quite a few, diff quite a few nodes and quite a few web forms. So essentially you are testing on a vanilla version of your site, not the uh, kind of copy. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a site build that you're testing yeah. on. It's like simple test me website. It's creating for you a, yeah. a, a Drupal, vanilla Drupal with that specific uh, module to test out the functionality. Essentially, you do that as they do in the pipeline, and then you are have to build all the configuration to achieve that particular um, test. For example, uh, a content type with many fields and whatever. Yeah. Everything of that needs to be config imported and, and created in order to do that specific test. That's right, yeah. So you, you saw how those config install directories are full of config. Well, they're all getting loaded with that module and the tests. Yeah, and this is in, in addition of, like, you, you do your test script on a working site where the configuration is already there. You just run your test script. But in case of a uh, pipeline, you need to get everything ready to have the, 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 the same test uh, running essentially. And this is an extra kind of big thing to do before you are ready to, to do the test in the pipe, during the pipeline. Well, that's all done when the test runs and it's, it does the same thing on the local as well. So it's building the, the um, if you, if you go to the basic instructions for, for creating browser tests, you, you um, extend a test base class, a browser class, which includes all that in it. And it's building everything that you need, that, as much of that site build that you, as is needed for those tests. You, you probably, in that case, we're probably building 80% of the site. And as you as you run your build your tests, say just just using say one of those dashboard pages like the requests page for instance. So if you just do a Drupal get test on that page, it'll come out with a whole lot of errors. We're missing this field. We're missing this module. And so you okay, I'll add that field. I'll add that module. And then you run it again. And then it says it's missing this field. It's missing this module. So you add those, and slowly. You, you add the config, you add the modules, you saw the great piles of config and modules, and then eventually the test runs. The, that, that, 
page, the request page, loads and there's no errors. It's nice friendly dots and you've got some browser output. So you'd, you'd start with just one test. You know, obviously I was trying to reverse engineer lots of tests. So you just start with one test and you, you build that page, like a, just a view page. It might require adding 12 modules and 10 config items just to get the test to Drupal get that page. And so you can write the test and then just slowly build it based on the error message you get until no error messages and you can see the page and it comes in the browser output. 